Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 68 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Lilo and Stitch on your They're Nuzzling My Flesh With Their Noses podcast. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. I am really excited for this one. Um, this is uh, its probably my second favorite Disney movie. Oh, I didn't know that. If it hadn't been for the, the case that I saw Aladdin with my mum when I was a boy, this would probably be number one, but... That obviously has a very special place in in uh, in my uh, oh what's the word nostalgia. Okay. <laughs> hey, okay. this is going to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> when this uh, before this came out, they released a few trailers for it that were uh, kind of jokes in other Disney movies, and I remember seeing them and going, "This is so different for anything I've seen from Disney before." I'm I'm just so excited for this. And mm-hmm. was like, couldn't wait for it to come out. Went and saw it on my own opening weekend. Then went and took people the following weekend when they were free. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I was so excited for this. The trailers, there, there's one for, uh, let me get this right, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Little Mermaid, and The Lion King. Mm-hmm. And it's like the um, a tale old as, as time dance sequence in Beauty and the Beast. Mm-hmm. But Stitch is crawling along the ceiling, and then he goes onto the chandelier and causes the chandelier to fall on them. <laughs> and, and and Belle goes off in a huff. Oh! And it, in Aladdin, it's the whole new world sequence, and he pulls up next to them in the kind of red convertible spaceship. Wolf whistles at Jasmine, and then she gets in the car and goes off with him. Oh no! <laughs> They're so. Okay. And it's just it's so different from anything Disney did before. Yeah. Just like oh, okay, this is going to be good. Okay. I would probably say Stitch is my favorite character from Disney. Even if this isn't the not quite the number one film. Oh wow! So. I had no idea you had such a love of this movie. Even I mean, mm. I knew you had the Stitch plushies, but huh? Okay. <laughs> we are very, very different people. Yeah, and and it's surprising. So Stitch is heavy in sort of geek culture. You see him everywhere. You see him branded with other things and introduced with other characters. So I'm surprised you've never seen it. I, I'm assuming you were at least aware of Stitch. Um, I mean, I was aware that Lilo and Stitch was a movie. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's about where it that's is. That's a start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's about it. I honestly didn't actually know what this movie was about. I mean, I knew it took place in Hawaii. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's where I was before I watched this movie last week. So you just didn't see it because didn't excite you? Because, uh, Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, so the reasons that you were so excited about it are the reasons I wasn't. In 2002, I was still very much a Disney princess kind of person. Like, okay. I wanted my Disney to be about Disney princesses. Right. And this very obviously wasn't. And so I was thinking in my head, "Eh, that's so different. I'm not interested. It's not going to give me the Prince Charming Princess thing that I want. Blah. Right. Okay. So I just never watched it. Okay. Because this is almost slap bang in the middle of the decade where they did other stuff. Mm -hmm. Basically, you finish up the the Renaissance with Mulan and Tarzan. And then Mm -hmm. the 2000s, they start releasing Dinosaur and... Atlantis and Treasure Planet and Chicken Little and, and films that did not do what they wanted them to do, but they were trying new things. And, and in amongst it there, there are some absolute gems. Emperor's New Groove is a terrific film. Lilo and Stitch is wonderful. But it's only, uh, as I say, it's a decade later, effectively, they start going, okay, let's do Princess and the Frog, let's do Tangled, let's do Wreck-It Ralph and Frozen. And and they, they become the company we know them as today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so ask me how many of those, like, new things movies I've seen. (laughs) Go on. (laughs) I'm fairly certain I did watch The Emperor's New Groove, but I'm not entirely positive about that, and the other ones, definitely not. Right. (laughs) Nope. Not a single one. I've only seen a couple of them myself as well. Dinosaur is just dull as dishwater. Bolt is surprisingly good. Bolt is not as bad as it seems like it would be. That was Disney? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, okay. see, none of these films feel like Disney. This is also the mm-hmm. era when you've got films like um, Shrek and Titan AE coming out, which they're just trying to keep up with these other animation companies doing other right. things that are, again, to a lesser or greater extent, successful. 
Titan A okay. was not successful at all. So no, I haven't seen it. Oh, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> Um, I did start seeing some of the non-traditional Disney movies later. Um, hmm. Cars. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen Cars. I s- didn't see two or three, and I didn't see Planes, but I did okay. see Cars, and I loved hmm. Cars. Yeah, Cars is wonderful. But I don't think I've seen any any of the other stuff that would fit into this sort of non-princessy world. Yeah, films that do not have romance as one of their core plots. Right. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I've seen Toy Story. I haven't seen Toy Story 2 or 3. Oh, I watched two, Toy Story 3 earlier. And then I had a big drink to rehydrate. It's very <laughs> emotional. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Yeah. Disney cast. <laughs> Come back next week when we talk about the 2010 period. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Released in 2002, Lilo and Stitch is Disney's 42nd animated feature film. It was written and directed by Dean DeBloy and Chris Sanders, who also voiced Stitch, and featured the voices of Davy Chase, Tia Carrer, David Ogden Steers, Kevin McDonald, Ving Rhames, Jason Scott Lee, and Kevin Michael Richardson. Lilo and Stitch opened in second place behind that year's Minority Report, but it is estimated that more than 53 million tickets were sold during its original run, bringing in more than 273 million worldwide. It received positive reviews and was nominated for the 2002 Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, though it lost to Spirited Away. Thanks to its worldwide success, the film spawned a franchise. There was a direct-to-video sequel called Stitch the Movie, followed by a Lilo and Stitch television series that ran from 2003 to 2006. A second sequel, Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch Has a Glitch, was released in 2005, and a third sequel, a made-for-TV film called Leroy and Stitch, was released in 2006 as a finale for the series. And both Japan and China have created animated series that ran after the American series ended. Yeah, this uh, caught on almost more than most other things, Uh, certainly from the Renaissance and that sort of period. Right. Hmm. I was surprised by how much stuff there was. Yeah, it's very clever. The the setup for the series is that he's experiment 626, so he has to go and find the other 625 experiments. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's great. It actually sounds interesting. (laughs) And and there's like, there's a massive one, there's an electricity one, there's a flying one, there's Angel, which is the, the... Smurfette equivalent. And then there's Leroy, who I think might be 625. And Leroy is kind of Stitch, but he likes sandwiches rather than chaos. Oh, <laughs> and, and that, has that's that, awesome. I think, like New York accent or something. Huh. Okay. Um, yeah, so Stitch has become a proper Disney attraction. He is always part of the marketing. There, there are some of these um, films that kind of just disappeared a few from this period that, that we've mentioned you know you don't see much from the emperor's new groove or dinosaur but there's even the older ones uh the aristocats or dumbo or pinocchio occasionally are brought up and you see either you know plushes or on mugs or in the fairground rides and so on but stitch is always there there's there's something for him for almost every one of the parks um he's got a, an actual kind of ride attraction mm-hmm. um in florida i think in Disneyland there was a whole not virtual reality but like Disney would appear on a screen and there'd be a person who would be able to talk as though he was stitched in the background and like interact with people Mm -hmm. so he has become a proper attraction he's part of the the Star Wars weekends lineup so when they do Star Wars as like a month at the Disney parks they turn some of the existing characters into Star Wars characters you know Mickey is Luke and Goofy is Han and so on Stitch has alternately been Yoda and the Emperor which basically sums up Stitch. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you see him drawn with BB-8, um, with Toothless. So, And, and you've uh-huh. not seen How to Train Your Dragon, I think. Uh, no, I... No. I okay. have feelings about that. <laughs> okay. So Chris Sanders, um, and I think Dean DeBloy as well, they, they were the ones who turned the book into the film. And okay. Toothless is, as we know him from the films the way Chris Sanders has drawn him and he is basically a kind of dragon version of Stitch. So you very often see them together and quite often also paired with uh, Totoro from my neighbour Totoro. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. So like I say, I'm surprised you haven't 
certainly had an awareness of the character because he just sort of crops up in geek culture quite a lot. Yeah, I'm yeah. very oblivious, I guess. <laughs> this is the thing, thing where, yeah, now you are going to see him everywhere, aren't you? <laughs> I'm afraid I will, yes. Mm. <laughs> All right. So I actually really liked the IMDb brief synopsis because I was racking my brain trying to figure out how to put the essence of this movie into a single sentence and was having a hard time. Okay. IMDb says, a Hawaiian girl adopts an unusual pet who is actually a notorious extraterrestrial fugitive. And it's kind of right. Yeah, interesting that that is from Lilo's perspective. She is the protagonist in that bit of the plot. Or in that um synopsis. Oh, yeah. But yeah. you could tell this from, you know, uh, uh, experiment escapes captivity and wreaks havoc on Earth before learning family. Yes. <laughs> I could go either way. Yeah. But we'll get into that oh, in a minute. Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hannah. How did you watch the film? Where is it available over there? Well, all of the sequels are available on Netflix. Okay. <laughs> but Lilo and Stitch Proper is on Hulu. <laughs> right. <laughs> How about you? Um, I own it. Of course you do. <laughs> it is available for rental places, um, but yeah. it's not for, for, on sort of a, a major streaming service. Yeah, I think you could rent it on Amazon mm. as well. But on as far as a streaming service, it's it's Hulu here. I was surprised when I looked up Lilo and Stitch on Netflix and I got all of these Lilo and Stitch 2 and... These other, like, Lilo yeah. and such things. And I was like, why are these here? But the actual movie I'm looking for is not. It made no yeah. sense. Really interesting. Um, okay. Like you said up top, there are a lot of people who have done a lot of other things in this. Um, what's your experience of the creators, of the voice actors? Okay. Well, I had to look all of them up because the only person... There are two people who I recognized by name in the list of right. cast and creators. But it's a Disney movie, so I looked everybody up because chances are I've probably heard them in something, right? Mm. <laughs> so uh, Dean DeBlois was co-head of story on Mulan, which happens to be my favorite Disney movie. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Uh, Chris Sanders had done work on Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, and Mulan. Uh, Davy Chase actually voiced Chihiro in the English dub of Spirited mm. Away, and she played Samara in The Ring. <laughs> yeah. Which I have actually seen. <laughs> She is a versatile actress. <laughs> she is. Tia Carrere looks so, so familiar to me. And I remember her from True Lies. Uh, and she's done a lot of various TV guest spots. And so I've probably just mm. seen her face and like not realized it was the same person. Okay. I feel like she had a series like Nikita or something. Mm. I can't remember. Possibly. Possibly. Know, but there is there, there is another major film that I know you haven't seen, so we will see that at some point. Okay. Mm. Um, I will forever and always know David Ogden Sears from MASH. Mm. Um, although apparently he has done various Disney voices and TV guest spots and was also a voice in the English dub of Spirited Away. And Ving Rhames, I thought I had seen more, which shouldn't surprise me since we talked about this when we did Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Mm. Um, so clearly I know him from Pulp Fiction and Mission Impossible and Con Air. Uh, my favorite thing that he's ever done are the Arby's commercials. If your child ever asks you where do sandwiches come from, tell them the truth. Look them straight in the eyes and tell them sandwiches come from Arby's. And if they ask where the loaded Italian and its many meats come from, kindly respond. What part of Arby's didn't you understand, Giuseppe? Okay. <laughs> Forget your filmography. But those burgers. No, they're not burgers. They're not beef burgers. And gravy. Yeah. It's roast beef. Yeah. <laughs> it's roast beef. And and I believe I will probably insert my very favorite one in here. Okay. Just so people can hear it. <laughs> what part of Arby's don't you understand, Giuseppe? <laughs> Oh, God, it's so funny. I can't help it. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the other people who were in this, I was wholly unfamiliar with. So okay, I, I didn't even list them here. Um, but yeah, lots of Disney and lots of voicing things. And then there's MASH. That's very fair. 
Um, and you're you're very familiar with animated films, I think, in general. I am, especially like during the Renaissance of Disney. I think I saw every Disney movie ever made during that period. Okay. <laughs> and um, now that I think after the the Tangled era, once they started with Tang, like well, Wally was Pixar before Pixar mm, was acquired yeah. by Disney. But after Disney acquired Pixar and they started doing more different things i think i've seen almost everything they've done since then too yeah yeah so there was basically this decade missing from your history with them yes yeah <laughs> yeah it's just the the 2000s just did not work for me and i was also probably in that oh that snobby period where i think i'm trying to become a grown-up so i can't watch disney anymore I, Ugh, i'm pretty sure films. i went through that period when i was hmm. in college and right after got it yeah, being cool becomes important at some point. And then you go, no, I want to like stuff again. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, uh, are you too cool for this film or did you like it? I did like it. Um, I yeah. don't love it like you do. Okay. Um, I'm not sure anybody loves it like you do, though, now that I'm listening <laughs> to you talk about it. I enjoyed it. I laughed a lot. It was nice, but I, I don't know that I would actively go watch it again the way I would a Mulan or a Little Mermaid or a Tangled. Okay. Is, I, I don't know if I can ask this without it sounding like I'm being snobbish about romantic things, but is it because there's no romance plot to it? Is that a thing you go no. to? I mean, obviously that's a thing I go to. You know that about me. <laughs> Anybody who's ever talked to me about movies knows that about me. Um, no, I think... I'm going to have to give some thought as okay. to why. Because, I, I mean, I, I did get emotional during some parts. I think it's just because I don't relate to the character of Stitch very well. I loved Lilo and I loved Nani. But Stitch wasn't, like, that part of the plot, like, Stitch and the aliens chasing him was mm. the least interesting thing about this to me. Okay. Probably, again, because there's no emotion there. That's right. just purely act driven by action. And I liked the family aspect. Mm. And the parts that made me tear up where Stitch was involved were the parts where, you know, he's showing her the picture book and he's trying to tell her he's lost. Mm. And he's finally figuring out that he has a family. Those parts of Stitch I really enjoyed. But just the fugitive alien chase wasn't super interesting to me okay got it but it was funny sometimes yeah I, I i did expect that you would enjoy it on those terms the fact that this is a film all about family of choice and that is your thing right you particularly enjoy film for yeah i thought that was going to be um right up your alley yeah and and realizing at the end that they all stayed like even the two who were chasing him stayed and became part of the family mm. that was amazing mm. i really really liked that and uh, so I guess I just needed the beginning of this movie and the end of this movie and most of the middle. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is a very, very funny film. Again, not in a traditional Disney way. There's just so much small oddness going on. And this this might be related to some of the discussions we've had around uh, Monty Python. Mm -hmm. There's stuff that almost doesn't make sense or doesn't belong there or doesn't need to be there. I like it because the film just does it because it's funny. So the bit where where she holds him as a record player, and it's just the silence, <laughs> and then the music and the silence, and it's so <laughs> weird because they're looking aghast at him. <laughs> it works for me. It works so well. <laughs> well, I think as a bit of humor, that did work because it fit very well into Lilo's character mm. because Lilo is weird. Yes. And and so like the the weird awkward silence kind of fit in with the vibe that they were building for her, so I thought it was funny and it didn't seem out of place to me. Okay, uh, th that's one example. But there's just the thing of when they're doing the rescue at the end, they're talking about what they're about to do, and he's just breaking part of the panel off and eating it, and then he's told <laughs> to spit it out, and then they carry on with it. There's just there's there's no opportunity missed to try and have something funny in unless it's trying to do emotion. Yeah. I think I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy it quite so much because it really does work to add a lot of levity to it. Um, I I love you know when when Nani goes to him when Lilo's been taken, she says you know I know you can talk talk and he talks and she shrieks and clubs him one. Yeah, 
that was funny too because the way he talked it was in a way we'd never heard him talk before yeah. he kind of had that new york accent okay 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was good he was funny i i can i can agree with that i think um, the, the interactions were funny, too. I think one of my favorite lines that I, I didn't actually write down in the favorite section was Lilo's running around. Oh, good. My dog found the chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's it's bonkers. It is absolutely crazy in, in almost a way that would fit more to some of the uh, the animated series they did around this time. And I'm mainly thinking that because there was a series called Bonkers. Oh, that, that okay. Did I didn't know that. Zany comedy very heavily but to see it in a film like this and then and then so the flip side of that is the fact that the film has this massive heart in in the middle of it that you could oh yeah you could make this story a really intense thing about nani about this 19 year old girl who's trying to understand what it is to be becoming an adult while she's also suddenly a mum and not a sister and dealing with all the pressures that everyone around her is putting on her you know Mm -hmm. looking after the girl getting a job, going on a date with this guy or not going on a date with this guy. It just, it's so well done. She, it, This could absolutely be her story. Mm-hmm. But then you also have it being told from Lilo's perspective of her still trying to be a girl and play and have fun. But you're right, she's a bit weird. And at the same time, she's <laughs> trying to deal with the changes with her relationship with her sister. And she knows that has to change, but she doesn't want it to. So she rebels and she causes trouble. When she slips into her, you know, childish ways, mm-hmm. it's lovely. And then, and then you have the story told from Le- from Stitcher's perspective of, I am now in this universe. What do I mean? What do I do? How do I fit? And and finding right. his family. Yeah. See, now all of that stuff is the stuff that I really loved about this movie. I yeah. think this. Um... The way Disney chose to portray a broken family and actually Mm. literally call it out as a broken family was something I don't think had ever been done before in a child's movie, Mm -hmm. really. And this was probably one of the most realistic deaths of a parent we'd ever seen in a Mm -hmm. Disney movie. And that part, they did really, really well because it, it wasn't like frozen you know the death of the parents and frozen drive elsa to hide away for forever because she doesn't have anybody on her side Mm, anymore you know like it drives the the whole plot of the movie and this the the death of her parents is a thing that happened and it changed her life but that's not what's driving the action Mm. it's just a thing that happened in her past it's not the reason this movie exists yeah. and that doesn't often happen because usually even even in non disney movies when you're you know doing a coming of age movie from any studio the teenager has always had this horrible past because their parents died and now you know they're broken and horrible and somebody has to come fix them and we didn't get that in this and i thought that was really clever hmm. and really kind of true to life as true to life as you can be in a disney movie about an alien yeah and the the story with lilo and nani would be happening whether stitch was in that story or not and arguably right. it might not go as well mm-hmm. um so so that's you're absolutely right it, it's so core and fundamental to it that you could ignore the rest of it and get something very nice out from it but then you also have mm-hmm. Jumbo and Pleakley delivering the sort of comedy of aliens trying to fit in and doing alien things. <laughs> yeah. Which we've not talked about because it, it's not that it doesn't work for me, but by and large, it's uh, a more slapsticky comedy. It was very slapsticky. Mm. Which is not so bad sometimes. I do like Jumbo because they don't betray his character. He is not a villain. But he is someone who doesn't really have too much of a moral code. So he's creating experiments that can wreak havoc for fun. And then uh, he's hunting them down, but he knows that he's restrained because he's got to be working with the council and and working in their way. And then as soon as he's fired, he goes back to wreaking havoc again. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I I appreciated that about him. He always... I don't want to say he always worked within the rules, because obviously he was breaking the rules at the beginning, because that's how Stitch was created. Mm. But he 
when he was given a job to do, he tried very hard to do that job. And then when he didn't have that job anymore, he did what he wanted to do. And then at the end, when he was given the opportunity to either continue to wreak havoc or to actually help Stitch, because Stitch was his creation, he felt that kinship with him. So he decided to help him, Mm. you know, and he had the freedom to do that. And it didn't seem out of character. Yeah. And, And like I said, with Farscape, I love that these are alien looking aliens. Oh, very much alien-looking aliens, except mm. for the one that looked like a shark. Yeah. I can't remember his name. Oh, uh, Gantu? Sure. The, the giant, giant general. Yes. Yes. He looked like a shark. But giant. Threw me off every time. Yes, but giant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I love that they're all very different aliens. And I love that there's even a little robot one who throws up some nuts and bolts at one point. <laughs> Oh, I don't think I noticed that one. Uh, you know, right at the very beginning when they're, when they're having the trial, effectively, mm-hmm. and Stitch does his... <laughs> whatever he says. Yeah. <laughs> one of the robots, lean, the little robot dude, leans over the side and throws up some nuts and bolts. <laughs> oh, see, I, I caught that he threw up. I just didn't know what he threw up. Because yeah. I was too busy trying to figure out, like, what did he say that made them react like that? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they never tell us. Mm. But yeah, Nani in this, I I absolutely love her as a character. I, I that thing of she's trying to work out how to change her situation, and she's got pressure to go and get a job. So she goes that that when David finally comes to her and says, "Oh, I've got you a job. You have to come now," she leaves Lilo at home because she's been told she has to get a job, and she's not necessarily oh. grown up enough to think, "Oh, should I? Should I not? No, I've got this instruction. I've got to get a job. So I'll go and do this, and it'll be fine." Oh, yeah. No, I was shouting at the TV at that moment. Like, I was watching this with two other people in the room, mm-hmm. and I was shouting at the TV at then. I was like, do not leave her alone in the house when you know the social worker is coming back today. Don't <laughs> do that. And she did. Uh, <laughs> she didn't listen to you, did she? She did not listen to no. me. Oh, uh, nope. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, she's a 19-year-old, so she's trying to balance hmm. it all. I, I get that. It's hard. And uh, talking about the story that would have happened between her and Lilo anyway, and, and particularly with Cobra as well, argue, he ends up taking her away because of what the aliens have done. But I don't mm-hmm. think he's necessarily wrong to be doing that. We're, we're not setting up Cobra to be uh, the, the evil, creeping person who's trying to split apart this family. He's trying to do what's best for them. And look, and, and he says very plainly to Nani, he talks and says, you have to consider if you're the right thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and she's, what's his line? You've been adrift in the sheltered harbor of my patience. You know, he is trying as well to, to make this work, right. to find a way for them to, to make it happen. But if she's not right, he will do what's necessary. And he does. And it's not the incorrect thing necessarily. No, but he, uh, he twisted that knife in just a little bit too deep, I think, when he said... It doesn't seem like she needs you, but you need her. Mm. That was just a little too cruel. But I, I, I understand he was frustrated at that point because he had given her chance after chance. Yeah. And she still wasn't kind of stepping up. But I, I have lots of feelings about that part of the story mm. because... Nani didn't involve Lilo in any of it. She never sat down and said, hey, Lilo, we need to be a certain way so that they don't take you away from me. And like convince Lilo to just behave for a couple days. Mm. Like That's what I would have done had I been in Nani's situation. I would have been like, hey, I know you're upset and I know that you want to be this weird little girl who lays on the floor and, you know, locks herself in the house. But cool. Let's do that after the social worker leaves. Yeah. I, I would have tried to go that route, and they didn't do that. And I, I don't know, maybe maybe that's not realistic because Lilo's only eight or nine. I'm not even sure she's that old. Oh no, yeah, um, no, she's six in the film. Because oh, the she's six, yeah, the um, cake that he makes her at the end in the oven, they put seven candles on it. Oh, okay, yeah. So I mean, maybe it wouldn't have worked because she was so young, but she certainly acted older than a six year old mm. <laughs> in the movie. But I th- I think you're right, Cobra, even though they showed him as this big, like, ex-CIA <laughs> yeah, right. military scary man, you could tell he really wanted what was best for Lilo, and he was just trying to do his job. Mm. And and he wanted to help Nani, I think, as well. 
and and yeah exactly as you say he loses his patience at, at that point when the house is destroyed to be fair but he says is this what she needs right so it's, it's good normally again normally a disney film i don't think would portray this quite so well Right. And I think I think that's what this film has going for it. While I didn't really appreciate the entire story itself, mm. it had some pieces that were just so full of heart that were wonderful, but it it has this level of authenticity that you don't often see in an animated film. Um, not only in how the family is portrayed, but how it portrays Hawaii and Hawaiian mm. culture. Yeah. I mean, this this has come up recently Mm -hmm. with uh, Disney's movie Moana, and they got a lot of backlash on how they portrayed Polynesian culture, Mm -hmm. not only just because it was a fictional world that they were appropriating this culture, but because they didn't do it well. But I think they researched this so much, and they worked so hard to show Hawaiian culture properly. I mean, in in as much as they showed us that, that Nani's job depended on the tourist trade she worked at that luau and when she couldn't work at a place that was dependent on the tourist trade anymore she didn't have options Mm. that there was no more jobs yeah exactly there was nowhere else for her to go and that kind of that's a level of detail you don't expect Mm. in a disney film and so i feel like they worked really really hard to just be as authentic as possible and and that is a reason why this movie gets a little bit more elevated in my eyes. Yeah, you are absolutely bang on there. The the way it deals with Hawaii. I, I have seen people saying that there is what could be seen as problematic elements of it because it only shows um it shows the luau, it shows the hula dancing, it it, it others Hawaiian people and Hawaiian culture. But I think that's not necessarily a criticism because it's the differences that make things interesting. If we were seeing mm-hmm. Lilo going to school and doing, you know, American studies, that's not the most interesting of things. But seeing her learning and being in, in, uh, in involved in Hawaiian culture is interesting. And it shows that she is part of that culture where one of the problems with Moana was it was trying to show some of it, but then completely ignore it in other places. Right. And, and this is, I've been to Hawaii a couple of times. This film is directly responsible for me going. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, in, in, in general, <laughs> always wanted to go. But yeah, seeing it in this and some of the some of the scenery they use, some of the way they show the life here, it's like, oh, this is an interesting place, clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been to the town this was set uh, based on, effectively. And, and it is like that. Without tourism, there are basically no shops and no restaurants. There's no reason for it to exist too much. Right. Just to keep on that kind of same subject of mm-hmm. authenticity, it, I didn't really catch this right away but just a very very subtle detail is at the beginning when we meet Lilo it's because she was trying to give Pudge a sandwich because it's sandwich day Mm. and the reason she's doing that is because she says Pudge controls the weather Mm -hmm. and then we find out later that her parents died in a rainstorm and so it it makes sense that that she is obsessing over such a detail like that Mm. and it was very subtly done in the movie. It, it's not something that they kind of said, oh, hey, look at this metaphor thing that we're trying to do. It was just, <laughs> it was there. Yeah. And y- you blink and you miss it. And I think those kind of details are really what elevate movies like this. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a few of them. And that one's very nice because it could be doing the kind of party of five story or it was a drunk driver or it was an accident and someone else was involved. But this is just... It's a, a complete accident that these two were affected by. Right. Mm. And it, if we're getting a little bit into the details that, that they do very nicely, I quite like that the councilwoman, at the, at the beginning, during the trial, she says to Stitch, uh, you know, give me some sign that you are good, that you're understanding what's going on. And he clearly says something outrageous and licks the glass and waves his bottom at her. So they exile him. <laughs> And then it's at the end when she finally sees him again and they're taking him away. But he says, you know, this is my family. I found it. It's broken, but it's still good. And and mm-hmm. she gets that sign from him that she wanted. And that's the point which she can say, yes, we can make some sort of allowance here. We can we can work with this. So it comes back very nicely. But he has to go on this experience to, to be able mm-hmm. to come back and uh, act with her like that. Yes. Mm. I wasn't expecting her to show back up. 
And mm. that was a nice little twist for me. I didn't know how it was going to end, honestly, because okay. they had like all these different factions, essentially, mm. like warring for, for Stitch. Um, and so I didn't expect her to just say, I'm going to do it myself and, and come down. Um, but I'm glad she did because she did get to see that he has evolved and that he's worth saving. Mm. Yeah, it's a very nice touch. Yeah. I think <laughs> my favorite detail uh, was the payoff about the endangered mosquitoes. Mm. Yeah, Gosh, that's when clever. that started... <laughs> When that started, I was like, mosquitoes are endangered in the universe? What? Like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on right now. And then you get, you know, it's almost like a three beat, I think, because you get that at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like, we can't destroy this planet because to get Stitch back because of the mosquitoes. Yeah. And, and, it, then... and it seems like it's going to be uh, just the setup that it's people. Because it's it's you know the kind of prime directive thing we could, it's there's a sentient civilization there so we can't do that no no it's mosquitoes it's, it's the mosquitoes, most yeah. bloody annoying insects <laughs> <laughs> and then you get the the scene where the mosquitoes are attracted to the alien and <laughs> yeah. they're nuzzling his flesh you know and then at the end you get the payoff from Cobra when you realize that he used to be CIA and he said that he convinced an alien species that mosquitoes were an endangered species yeah. That's very and I thought nice. that was fantastic. It, yeah. Like that was that's how you do a three beat. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. You just it's S- good. Set it up, follow up, invert it. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you just don't see it coming. No. And it's it's almost funny. Is it almost funny? Would they have known this? I don't know. Uh, there are mosquitoes in Hawaii. But only at certain areas and only below certain altitudes, um, because they've not been there that long. They know mm-hmm. which ship it was in, I think, the late 1800s that came and changed water and dumped mosquitoes on the islands. Because they didn't exist there before oh, wow. that point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Mm. I liked that place. There was a lot of fun stuff to do. <laughs> I would like to go there one day. Mm, worth it. No, I have to go to London first. That's fair. <laughs> um we had a couple of good comments from people um mo- mostly people with adoration for the this film uh kate at id human things uh it gives some unique representation without feeling try hard especially for that time period and it sticks to disney's anti-parent narrative because leela is sec- secretly a princess and <laughs> it's cute and fluffy <laughs> <laughs> that's fair mm. i'm not sure i thought disney were anti-parent but also yes their stories are very much about children set adrift. Yes. Well, because I can't think of a single Disney movie where both parents are alive. Mm. I mean, Tangled, but that's got a different thing going on with the parents. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, Peter Pan, but kind of not. The Lion King is all about daddy issues. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it it is a thing, mm. I, and I I don't really know why. Maybe that that's a whole other conversation to have about yeah Disney analysis. I, I imagine it's all about um you know make it relatable for children and for children their their parents are their whole world. But you know that's just me spinning a thing. Uh, we also had Erica at Prairie Girl. She said I watched this years ago with my young nieces at a difficult time in my life. I didn't expect much, but found it surprisingly delightful, and it really cheered me. Yeah, and. That is one of the wonderful things about cinema is when you go with not high expectations and not even necessarily cinema watching at home or watching with people. It's just when you see something that is good and that is as, as certainly as good as this is, it's a great experience and you do feel uh, delighted. You have things to think about, you have things to go on. So thank you very much. That's that's really good feedback. And I love, um, uh, I love when people like this film. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and finally, we had a Notorious Stabulous at Trek Girl 88 She said, I always think about both Jumba and Stitch's similar arc, from evil to compassionate parts of a family. I guess it's a nature versus nurture question. Would they have had that arc if not for Lilo's and Nani and David to a lesser degree influence? Also, family is a huge theme, both the family you're born to and the family you make. Stitch recognizes its importance pretty quickly, and when Nani throws him out, he's devastated. This is the part where my nephew sobbed every time, even though he knew it ends well. Oh, and Lilo teaching Stitch how to be proper using Elvis as an example is hilarious. The music is so good. 
that whole Elvis sequence was hilarious. Mm. But it also made me mad. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <sighs> because I don't buy that Stitch playing on a guitar is going to be loud enough to break all the glass <laughs> that got them in trouble. I just don't buy it. That was solely to create conflict and it's like false conflict because it's not real and i didn't like it well it was a ukulele and ukuleles have special powers okay (laughs) i still don't buy it sorry and yeah i love that thing about lilo's influence on stitch so if stitch is our protagonist and his story um and that's one of the reasons why it's hawaii because it was originally written to be kansas and they right. changed it for, for various reasons. But one of the points is this absolutely strands him on an island. So at this point, mm-hmm. he cannot go to a major city. He cannot use other transports. And particularly because he ends on the uh, the island of Kauai, which is the most northern island that's accessible. Because there's one that's more north, but it's privately owned. So he can't go there. Anyway. Um, and so the point is, there's, there is no major city. It's almost all green. This is the bit where... Jurassic Park is partially set and where Raiders of the Lost Ark is partially set because it's half garden, effectively. Um, right. So it forces it to become that thing of, okay, he can't do the thing he's that they've written him to do. So what does that mean for the character? The fact he meets this girl that needs him and he needs her in some ways and they work so well together, like you say, because of the oddness of both of them. Mm-hmm. It's really good. Yeah, I still don't know why Stitch ended up in an animal shelter like that's a thing that i don't understand because they found him and needed him to go somewhere so they called animal control because he got run over by the lorries right i know that Mm. but why he was clearly at that point he was still clearly not an animal anybody had ever seen he had like two legs and four arms and these antennas sticking out of his head like he was not a dog Mm. he was never a dog so why did he end up in the dog shelter Cause reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I I do remember uh, when I was taking notes on this one, like one of my early notes was, I don't remember Stitch having four arms in any of the pictures I've ever seen of Stitch. <laughs> like, like, this is so unfamiliar. Mm. I don't understand. Like, am I crazy? And then it was not long after that he realized that if he was going to try to pass as a dog, he didn't, couldn't have four arms. And so he like retracts them. And I was like, Oh my God, that's why he had four arms. Yeah. That's why I didn't know. <laughs> uh, that was, so, it was such a good detail. And I, I legitimately thought I was crazy for a minute because it's like, this is not the same stitch that I have seen around. Mm. <laughs> I was confused for a little bit. Okay. Can you tell me, uh, do you have favorite bits from this? Things that you particularly enjoyed? Lilo is amazing. I have to say that Lilo's darkness at the beginning was like it spoke directly to my heart. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, because I never had a dark period quite like that, but I loved it. You know, the whole thing when she's talking about her doll whose head was a little bit too big because (laughs) bugs went in there and laid (laughs) eggs and she's sad because she knows she doesn't have long to live. (laughs) Like that is quite the imagination. Yeah. And then when when she's upset and she's talking to Nani and she says, leave me alone to die. (laughs) (laughs) Like she is proper dark. And it was funny and it was it was sad, but it Mm. was funny. And I really, really liked it. Uh, Do you get the sense that she's using that as a kind of defense mechanism against facing her actual feelings and emotions over what everything's going on? Yeah, a little bit, because she's she's trying to make the world different Mm. because the world is different now you know she doesn't want to be the same that she was i think and that's a really good way to do it Mm. (laughs) and then um there was a moment between uh i think it was jumba and stitch but i'm not sure um the alien who's trying to catch stitch uh calls him an abomination and Stitch just looks at him and says, stupid head. Yeah. <laughs> and then they keep fighting. <laughs> and that's like, yeah, because one's in the spaceship. He's on the volcano on a lorry. So they're not even next to each other. They can't hear each other. <laughs> but neither <gasps> neither is afraid of the other. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it was fantastic. And um, there there were a lot of really good little one-liners in this one, mm. I think. And I'm I'm realizing... The more we talk about it, the more I like it. (laughs) 
I mean, I that happens, I think, a lot when when we end up talking about a movie that I wasn't super excited about. But yeah, this is interesting mm. because I'm hearing your excitement about it and and I'm able to kind of reciprocate a little bit because there are things that I really, really loved. And so now I'm sitting here thinking, wow, this really was a good movie and I should go watch it again. <laughs> it is a very solid movie. And like, it really is. The, the sequel's not bad. Um, Stitch has a glitch. And the series is okay at times. It does some good stuff. I've not seen all of it. But it's, it's uh, largely along the same lines. It's good fun. Okay. Mm. I'm not sure I like it enough to watch that much Lilo no, and Stitch. But that is a lot. This one, this one is good. It's, mm-hmm. it's got some good stuff going for it. Mm. Let me tell you some really good stuff then. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do like when Lilo calls him out for always destroying. She says, why can't you create something? And he very quickly rebuilds San Francisco that he'd seen in the the Tarantula movie on TV in the, in the TV shop. Oh, okay. That makes sense now. My question was, how does Stitch know what San Francisco looks like? Yeah, basically. I didn't catch that. Yeah, he's seen this That's brief awesome. bit on TV. And then he rebuilds it and makes himself the monster. And, and the way they animate it, they draw it to make him look like this giant monster. But just, and then, yes. and then you cut out to see him playing. It's almost the joke they did with Ant-Man. Of like, and you see this very small, you know, alien dude with a little car going, help me, help me, arg. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I cracked up at that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I like them going around the island. I, I like the sort of low key that we've had Jumba saying, you know, he will be drawn to big cities and destroy things and block up toilets and steal everyone's left shoe. <laughs> and then when they go around the island and you see these beautiful places and these, these um, you know, great locations. And then you finally get Lilo saying, it's nice being on an island with no big cities. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nice, just a very low key payoff, but that's mm-hmm. very well done. And that sets up exactly this thing we talk about of him having to find his place in the world at that point. Again, just for the comedy of it, when Jumba finally catches him, but they want to go and rescue Lilo. And and Jumba's just getting so angry, saying, you expect me to help you after everything you've put me through? You expect me to help you just like, just like that? Fine. Fine. You're doing what he says. Uh, he's very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like he really put up yeah. no fight. <laughs> <laughs> he's very persuasive. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um my absolute favorite moment, the bit that has me in hysterics every time is uh, again the juxtaposition of Stitch crashing into the island and you see it going down. Lilo pushes Nani out of the room and Nani falls on her. She's like, oh, gravity's increasing just in this one spot. Like, they're still <laughs> sisters. They're still playing with each other, which is nice. But then mm-hmm. Lilo runs back over to the window and she prays. And, and oh, I saw a thing somewhere. She's one of two Disney characters who prays ever or something. <laughs> um, but she prays and she says, you know, please send me an angel to look after us. Send us the nicest angel you have. And it cuts to this smouldering wreck and Stitch jumps out and he's got yep. glowing green eyes and a glowing green mouth and just this cackle, not the sort of comic cackle of Dr. Horrible, but the proper, I'm really evil and I'm going to mess stuff up. <laughs> yeah. It's so good because it, 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 I can remember first time seeing this, I didn't know what was going to happen. So, oh, this could be fun. <laughs> and I was, I was yeah. in it for the ride at that point. Oh, good. Yeah. It's a great film. It's a better film than I thought it was. <laughs> I can give you that one for now. Okay. <laughs> Are you pleased you've watched it? Yes. You know, I am I am always pleased that I've watched something after we've talked about it. Mm-mm. Because even if I don't enjoy the experience of watching the movie by myself, I always enjoy talking about it. Right. And good. sometimes talking about it changes how I feel. Mm-hmm. Like in this instance. Mm-hmm. So definitely, I, I am glad I watched it. I'm glad we talked about it. And I I feel a slightly more kinship to Stitch than I did before. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe I need a Stitch plush. I was about to say, you need a Stitch plush. Ugh, Stitch yeah. plush. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe I do. Hmm. I'll have to work on that. Keep your eye on, you know, QWERTY and Red Bubble and T-Fury and places, because he is always coming up on stuff. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So before we wrap up, is there anything else we need to discuss about Lilo and Stitch? Well, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. 
Disney has kind of really jumped on board this live action remake train. Mm. You know, we've seen Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast. They're working on Mulan. Would you want them to do a live action remake of Lilo and Stitch? Ooh. Uh, hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Because the Jungle Book was quite good. It, it was It was fairly fun. But I also didn't see the point of it. I've not seen Beauty and the Beast. Cinderella was very good. Because I can, I can understand why they're doing it. There are people who haven't seen these stories. And we are now at a point you don't have to animate them. You can make them actually even more tangible. Right. So I can understand the doing of it. But, God, this would have to be done so well. And the cast is so good. And one of the, one of the things I didn't I forgot to mention earlier, because it's Tia Carrera and Jason Scott Lee, who are both from Hawaii, they actually worked mm-hmm. with the writers and creators to make it even more authentic, to bring some colloquialisms and change some of the expressions they were using. Right. And I'd be really worried about losing that. The kind of uh-huh. uh, authenticity is the wrong word for you know this film, <laughs> but the 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 feeling that it does work that, that this is a story that you can buy into even outside of aliens chasing each other. Yeah, I I don't quite know how they would do the alien parts. Like in my head right now, I'm envisioning puppets like Seymour from Little Shop of Horrors. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why that's where my head is jumping when I think about how they could do a live action remake of this. I mean, but technology's come so far. They absolutely could. Mm. Well, like I say, the way they did the animals in the Jungle Book was very good. It it, yeah. it really worked. Um, so I could I could I'm not worried about it from the live action or special effects perspective. I'm worried about them rewriting this story. Okay, mm. that makes sense. Mm. All right. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. You can also email us at podcast at eloquentgushing.com. You can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. We are 100% funded by our wonderful patrons through Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com slash eloquentgushing, anything you can give gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and all our shows. Don't forget to uh, look us up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Is that what it's called? Google Podcasts? Google Play? Google, Google Play. Play. All the different radio options uh, where you can find us. Subscribe, uh, rate and review if you've liked us. And don't forget to visit the homepage, eloquentgushing.com, where you can find our other shows, our back catalogue, and sign up for our weekly newsletter that has all the latest news and announcements. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Until next time, I'm Andy Kay. And I like Fluffy. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, visit eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.